don't usually like to do unboxing embargoes. It's like you do a video, you can take the card out of the box. And uh, yeah, 6800 XT. Ooh. Then under there is the card. So I've got a 6800 and the 6800 XT and test systems. And I can show you the cards. These drop on Wednesday. So this is like your friendly reminder that's, hey, something's coming on Wednesday. But I can talk about 3090 performance. <laughs> so this is the Zotec RTX 3090. This is the first one that my bots were able to buy. Uh, that use a mostly standard process. I mean, at this point, NVIDIA has, has, has given up. You can't even buy the 3080 or 3090 on their website. Um, you can sort of keep an eye on Newegg. If you set up Newegg to where you can like one-click purchase, you might be able to get a 3080 or a 3090, but needless to say, it's pretty apparent that uh, manufacturing has not ramped quite as fast. And I think this is gonna play into uh, to AMD's hands. So we've got the RX 6800 XT and the RX 6800. These are both incredibly high-end cards. I can't share you share with you or remind you of what was in the, uh, the the press event. The thing that sets these cards apart really is some of their hardware features. Things like AMD Infinity Cache. That's first far and away at the top of the list. It's 128 megs of on-die cache for the memory. So <laughs> GPUs are becoming more like CPUs. The GPU doesn't have to go all the way to GDDR6 memory to get something if it's working on a particular problem set. There's also AMD Smart Access Memory, which is you know, the beginnings of letting the graphics card request what it needs directly from NVMe, kind of sort of bypassing the CPU, but according to AMD, leading to speed up in some games. You know, they say it's a 13% performance uh, increase on the RX 6800 XT in Forza Horizon 4 at 4K when combined with the new Rage Mode one-click overclocking. So that's a combination of things. And I, I can't clarify what they mean by that, but it's a combination of things. These graphics cards are also not overly bulbous. The 6800 is a true two-slot card with the 6800 XT being a two and a half slot card. So it's got a little bit bigger heatsink. Even my little Sliger SM580 lunchbox computer, I can put one of these, either one of these in that case, no problem. And that's an ITX, you know, super tiny machine. Of course, the new cards support DirectX 12 Ultimate and AMD Fidelity FX and variable rate shading. Those things sort of help propel game performance. There's also Microsoft Direct Storage support, but nothing's here that uses that yet. It's a future support kind of a thing. What's the difference between the 6800 and the 6800 XT? If you look at these cards, they look darn near identical. Well, the 6800 XT has 72 compute units, 16 gigs of memory, and a game clock of uh, 2.015 gigahertz. It's up to 2250 for the boost clock. The RX 6800, on the other hand, is 60 compute units, 16 gigs of memory, 1815 for the game clock, so quite a bit less on the on the frequency there, and also 2105 boost clock. Memory interface on both of these is 256 bit, and the infinity cache on both of these is 128 meg. So yeah, AMD's just exceptionally good at binning. A 6800 wasn't quite good enough to be a 6800 XT, so they turn off some compute units, they down clock it a little bit, it uses less power as a result, uh, but it's still insanely fast, at least according to AMD. I was also really encouraged to see that AMD's got a lot of launch partners for this, uh, this launch. Dirt 5, Godfall, World of, War World of Warcraft, Shadowlands, Riftbreaker, and Far Cry 6. So AMD does have the goods when it comes to working with game studios. I think that's lessons learned all the way back to Polaris days. If we look at, you know, previous AMD launches, it's very encouraging to see that in their press release. These two cards are available November 18th. The 6800 is priced at 579, suggested in user pricing, and 649, suggested in user pricing. Of course, there's also the 6900 XT. I don't have that, and even if I did, I couldn't show it to you. The 6900 XT is uh, going to retail for $9.99, and it's going to be even more performance than either one of these. Now, one thing, if you're looking at uh, the unboxing that we're doing and the published information directly from AMD in terms of performance, 
you know, even if you're not interested in performance this extreme at this price point, uh, you know, you, you gotta imagine it's gonna have an effect on the entire rest of the market and even used GPU prices and the kind of deals that you can get. But from a testing and qualification standpoint and from an apples to apples comparison standpoint, it's really hard. It's, uh, it's almost kind of intimidating because, I mean, look at all the new features that AMD is rolling out. Like these GPUs with the whole infinity cache thing are set up to behave more like CPUs. And so, you know, it looks like 256 bit memory bus, okay, but then the cache probably makes up for that if you look at the published numbers. And testing that across games, uh, it gets really interesting. Then you throw smart access memory into the mix, and you know, that's gonna take some hoops to jump through, one supposes, in order to configure it and do everything else. It's really, it's gonna be pretty tricky to find true apples to apples comparisons across the entire ecosystem for the performance of different games. Uh, ultra wide versus, you know, a 16 by nine resolution versus a 21 by nine resolution versus like a 34 by nine resolution. It's probably not gonna scale the way that you would expect. Um, and so I think it's gonna be, depending on what kind of a monitor you have and what kind of a gaming experience you're looking for, it'll probably be important to look at those differences, those performance differences, and do the testing and the evaluation and all that. But it's gonna be really easy to have, I think, fairly significant variance, depending on what all is set. Or at least it would, it, at least it stands to reason that one should be paranoid about that, given all of the publicly disclosed details that exist for uh, gaming and you know the move to 4k gaming seems like it's gotten here a lot quicker than I expected certainly gaming on my Asus uh, UX 4 uh, 438G the 43 inch 4k 120 Hertz monitor with the 3090 has been surprisingly good I never thought that at 4k that the system could be that responsive and so you know as the testing commences in the larger ecosystem of gpus things get interesting but little things in your system setup that you might not think would matter a lot kind of do end up mattering a lot at least you know like the 3090 if you use a crappy display port cable um stuff doesn't run right the display will black out every now and then little weird stuff that's all i can say for now it's uh it's it's a little intimidating like so that's why i say it's a little intimidating to try to do testing because there's so much new technology i mean to fidelity fx and content adaptive adaptive sharpening and all of the new technologies that all of the gpu companies are bringing to try to have a better gaming experience is genuinely very impressive average frame rate one percent lows and 0.1 percent lows are not necessarily the best overall indicator of performance because you do have things like content adaptive sharpening. So it's like, okay, we well maintain the frame rate, but you got four pixels there for a second because of a disoptimization in a game or something like that. So it gets really weird. And like fully automated testing can also get really weird because it's like game. It's really important that you maintain 60 FPS no matter what, but what you're experiencing at 60 FPS, which it can do, it's not necessarily the same from card to card to card. And then ray tracing. Ray tracing the whole, you know, I just, there's a lot of variables and I think it's a ton of fun to di dive in and do all this. But I can see how some people would just wanna buy something, plug it in and game and not fiddle with it. So it's pretty exciting times in the GPU industry. I mean, you know, you look at the 3070 and you look at the performance and it's like, wow, you know, we were paying $1,500 for the 2080 Ti just a couple of months ago for absolute top tier performance. And now that same level of performance has moved down quite a bit. Even if you just look at Team Green stack, the, the, the amount of compute per dollar you get, it's amazing. Why? Why would that be? Why would they do that? They would just, they're, they're just, they're doing that out of the goodness of their heart, aren't they? That's, that's gotta be it. That's gotta be, that's gotta be it. It's, it's just, that's what it is, right? I don't know. I don't know. I'll, you'll know in two days. I'll know in two days. We, I know nothing. I don't know. So I can also talk about the systems that these are going in. So our test systems, 
We're testing mainly on a 5900X, but we're also testing on a 10900K. So we've got the MSI Carbon EKX. This is a you know totally custom loop, 5.3 gigahertz, best at the best 10900K system that you can get 32 gigabytes of memory. Uh, 32 gigabytes of uh, 3600 memory in both systems, including the 5900X. Also doing a little bit of testing with the 5900XT. I wanna be able to revisit testing with something like the 5600X, the six core, because I think you'll be surprised at how well a six core is able to keep uh, monster GPUs fed, at least from preliminary testing with the Zotac RTX 3090. Now, in, for comparison, we're gonna be using the Zotac RTX 3090. It's a relatively recent version of the RTX 3090. It clocks reasonably well. It does run quite a bit cooler if you take the backplate off. <sighs> Zotac, that'll be, a, that'll be a different video. But, you know, the 3090, aside from being $1,500, is pretty respectable performance. Is it worth $1,500 over the 3080? Well, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a different video for, for a different day. I just want some comparison numbers and to sort of talk about things, touch base with you guys. You know, how's quarantine going for you guys? Is it, is it pretty good? Yeah, we've got, we've got a backlog of videos on Patreon that I haven't made live yet. You know, I don't know. We're just, just shooting the crap. You know, let me know how you're going in the comments and uh, if you're looking forward to Wednesday. Don't really want to overhype things too much because you know, product launches and, and the insanity that goes with the product launch and then like the software stack for the product launch and you know, here we are two months later with the with the, you know, the team green cars, and you know, it's still a mess in terms of buying them. Some of the other stuff, there's some rough edges on Linux with the, with the team green cars. And oh yeah, there's gonna be a Linux video on day one as well. I'm promising you that there's going to be a video on these cars on Linux on Wednesday. Might be a little later in the afternoon, um, but yeah, you definitely are gonna wanna look for those because I think there's gonna be some unique coverage to say the least on Wednesday. It's exciting. It's an exciting time. But uh, it's a nice, attractive box. Uh, AMD's also launching with partners in November. Uh, let's see, it's ASRock, ASUS, Gigabyte, MSI, PowerColor, Sapphire, XFX. So if one of those brands tickles your fancy a little bit more than the AMD reference cards, which are, you know, pretty awesome. I mean, you look at them, they've got a triple fan. It feels metallic. The fans also have the ring around the side. I think that's a patented innovation when you have the ring on the side because it increases the, uh, the static pressure through the heat sink. And, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's something you can just observe by looking at the card. It's also kind of surprising that the, the observation here of the, uh, the back plate, you know, the expansion slot back plate, it's not porous. It's not open. It's not exhausting air to the outside. That's, Interesting. We've got two 8-pin GPU power connectors on both cards. The cards really, they look identical. Completely identical. 16 gigs of memory, of course, is really nice for content creation. We know that from previous gen cards. Things like Premiere, Special Effects, the more video card memory, the better. The faster the video card memory, the better. Infinity Cache, like your GPU is more like a processor. You're able to cache certain transformational operations on the GPU. Seems like that would be good. Wait for the benchmarks. Yeah, I don't know. Just checking in with you guys. Doing doing some good stuff, hanging out. Uh, Dr. Dr. Cutrus, his channel, Tech Tech Potato. That's, that's something new and exciting you can check out. He just set up Patreon. Uh, plugged out a little bit. I always like talking to him. Super smart. Always, he's got the, his finger on the pulse of, uh, of the industry. Wants to get a little bit more into the whole YouTube personality thing. I don't, I don't know. It's a blessing and a curse. It's fun, fun sort of chatting with you guys. I mean, this is sort of an unconventional unboxing. There's not, you know. Ooh. Kind of minimalistic on the box. It says it's PCI Express 4. I'm pretty sure we already knew that. So uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm Wendell. This is level one. Ah, uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for hanging out. Thanks for watching all the videos, even the ones that don't have anything to do with anything. I don't know. It's fun. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun for me. I like chatting with people that have actual real problems and do actual real compute and uh, you know, sort of fun, fun, exciting things. All right. I'm gonna go hang out in the comments now. I'll catch you later. Mm -hmm.